Patty about this stuff. So, all right, kick it, Patty B. Let's get into it. One, two, three. Well, welcome to my whiskey den. Thank you, everyone, for stopping in on this lovely Monday night. We're lucky enough to have Gary here from Wood Hat Spirits down in New Florence, Missouri. He's got his head distiller Ryan as well, kind of out in the corner here. I want to bring that up. Oops, I removed him from the stream. That's not what I wanted to do. Sorry about that. <laughs> he's back in. He's out there running a batch of whiskey right now, so he's doing some work. And throughout time, he's going to take us on a little tour as we talk about what's going on out there. So we're lucky enough to have you both here. And thank you very much, Gary, for being on. We really, really appreciate it because you have a awesome backstory, and you do some unique stuff at your distillery that a lot of other people aren't. I know we usually say that with craft distilling and a lot of the people we interview – totally legitimately true with you you guys are doing some diff some completely different stuff so thanks for being on gary well you know this is kind of uh a break for me i've been stuck in my house for going on seven weeks oh so, <laughs> 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 a nice break you know the occasion to come down here and, and and get an isolation room and spray the house and you know, the Lysol spray and the hand work and everything else. And uh, enjoy an evening with you guys for a lot. So it's a, this is a special occasion for me. I always enjoy when somebody comes in and asks questions. And hopefully we can share some insight and uh, have a good time tonight. Yeah, we appreciate yeah. that. And we're hoping, I know Mike is for sure, and we're hoping to maybe stop in sometime later this summer, depending upon yeah. how everything goes. Um, but before we get going, I want to say thanks to Ice House. You're out there. We got Emily Chambers in the chat. We got AJ. We got Spencer Mav. Good to see you. Thank you guys for stopping in. People in the chat, what are you drinking tonight? And what is everyone in our chat drinking? And then we'll jump into the questions we normally get into. Um, I am finishing off the very tiniest, tiniest bit of Rubenesque I had left at the moment. Um, and then I'm going to have to switch over to something else. But I'm I'm just topping that one off here right now, so. That's what I'm doing too. I I'm I'm uh, sad that the bottle is gone, and uh, and and hopefully that that'll come around in my area again because it is it has been hard to come by here in the last few weeks. Yeah, I've got the uh, Pinhook Rye uh, Ride on the first Rye release from Castle and Key Distillery. Um, okay. And uh, enjoying that one. And what are you drinking tonight, Gary? I saw you pour something well, before. Yeah, I, this is what I'm drinking tonight. Oh. It's called uh, Bloody Dapper. Oh. So this is our new release, and it's kind of a companion to the Rubenesque. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, in the very beginning, the Rubenesque is, you know, means full-bodied. So this is a blue corn. This is a, our our number one seller, actually, we've yeah. had. So this is a, this is a companion one. The bloody dapper, which is a bloody butcher red corn, as a bourbon. Yeah. So that's what I'm <laughs> that's what I'm drinking tonight, and it's uh, uh, yeah. You guys should feel jealous. We just <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm sitting about drooling. <laughs> we were just, you know, when everything shut down, we were getting ready to release three new products, you know, and so. Uh, we had to just come down and drink them all ourselves, really. <laughs> it sounds like an invitation. We, we might take yeah. you up on that. Yeah. I'm only a couple hours yeah. outside. No. But right. that, that, and that one sounded really good. That was one of the ones I, I had Mike on a mission the last, like, like couple weeks to be see if he could find something out and about in Kansas City. And there's no. a couple ways that usually stored it, but it, they, they were all sold out of stuff. So, we're, yeah, we're, we'll get we'll get there. I'm going to we're going to stock up on some other stuff. So sure. we got three different things. You know, we just before we released, of course, this last year, we did the Missouri bourbon law. We got a Missouri bourbon law passed and we came out with the very first Missouri bourbon. You know, we've been able to make bourbon in Missouri. We've got four of those already. But after the law passed, you know, the stipulations that we put on it where it has to be, you got to grow the corn in Missouri. You got to cook it, ferment it, store it in Missouri, in a Missouri barrel that's made in Missouri. Now that's a, that's a Missouri whiskey, you know? <laughs> the reason we put all those things on it, because we wanted to, we wanted to be 
transparent about the whole thing, you know? Yeah. And I, I don't know how we, in the whiskey business, we said, oh, yeah, well, it's a Kentucky bourbon, but it was really aged in Indiana, and the, the barrel was made in Missouri, and the corn came from Missouri, and, well, the alcohol really started in Atchison, in Kansas. Right? <laughs> right? Well, we kind of wanted to avoid those people. We want to kind of slip in on something. <laughs> and make it hard for somebody to call something Missouri bourbon that wasn't all Missouri. So we, we put a lot of teeth in this thing. So, yeah, that is, yeah. that's that's really in depth. I dig that. And so you, our, first, our first one was, we were just getting ready to release this and we'll probably, I don't know, Mike, in the next couple of weeks, Kansas City, for some select people. Okay. This, this is the first batch you know, this is the batch one. Do you know which stores in Kansas City? Look, he's all excited now. You got to yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, know, I think Mike's will be on the obvious ones. Uh, really, the best way is to call them and say, "If you got that, I uh, yeah, that's what I was doing." And they're, they're all me, right? Yeah, and then we'll get it up there. So it's gonna be. We don't want to make a thousand bottles of that. You know, of the bloody dapper. Mm -hmm. There's only 215 of that first release. So we're not going to put that out for distribution. You know, with the, the virus shut down, yeah. we've kind of crippled the distribution system. And everybody sitting at home is ordering whiskey. They're buying a whiskey. But you know what they're buying? They're buying the cheapest damn thing they can buy. <laughs> get yeah. and, and that's leaving the craft people out in the open because... People like to try our stuff. They want to know yeah. it and they want to yeah. feel it. They want to be part of it. And when we drop that off, they're just going ordering the cheapest thing they can get. So it's going to put the, the, the squelches on a lot of us, but we're going to try to do some unique things. Probably going to do some, uh, I don't know, we're going to do some Zoom tastings. That's a nice, that's Great. an excellent idea. They can charge you five bucks to a Zoom meeting, yeah. limited number of people. And then give you credit on your account. So when you order something that automatically comes off and we'll deliver it to your house. You know, we're, we're, we're just looking at different options here. Cause yeah. I think in America, we never go backwards. When are we going to go back? We're not going to go back. We never go back. We always just go in a different direction forward. <laughs> I, I think the direction different forward is to somehow we've got to eliminate all the obstacles, mm -hmm. the costs, and the number of times it's handled between me and you guys. Yeah. Now we gotta yeah. figure that out. So how long how long until you guys are, are shipping directly to consumers from the distillery? We can't do that at all. Not in Missouri. You're saying they can deliver. They're getting well, the that's, that's why I mean. Yeah, I mean yeah. shipping is a loose term. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> muling. How about yeah, muling? Right. We're we're all about muling around here too. Yeah. Right. So it's kinda interesting. I can't ship it. But I can jump in the car and drag it to your car, to your house and, and deliver it to your front porch. <laughs> now, we can't do that for everybody. But yeah. for some people, like in mid-St. Louis, Columbia, Kansas City, you know, we're going to kind of start there. And if somebody wants something delivered, call us. And but maybe we've got somebody going there tonight. You know, yeah. we got we got some employees that go halfway there already. And, no. and and make it worthwhile for you going. Don't I mean one bottle is great, but you know, like like we were talking, if you're doing four or five, ten, twelve bottles, it makes the trip a hell of a lot more uh, more yeah. exciting. If you can get a couple of your friends together and do something like that when when you're trying to work that out, yeah, that, right, uh, and deliver to one house, you know, and you get one credit card, you know, so mm -hmm. we can we can take that. We'll be if we haven't got it today, it'll be soon. You can get on and charge on our website and. Or just call us. That's easy. Yeah. The old way. You know, we got telephone. Here's my credit yeah. card number. This is my address. And and say, okay, we're gonna for, we're gonna work with, we're gonna try to figure this thing out, guys. Yeah. It, it couldn't be that complicated. So exactly. Do you think you guys will ever get into uh, selling packs of smaller bottles so people can taste the range? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love the honesty with that. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's the best part. <laughs> Uh, little bottles are a pain in the ass. Yep. And yeah. I don't have a little bottle uh, filler. Now, having said that, 
you know, those middle bar, each one of them takes a different cola, got a different license, a different label. It's really a pain yeah. for a small guy that's got 13 things on the shelf to do small bottles. Now we can't, we already do some 375s. So some of our stuff that is uh, pretty hard to make, pretty rare, like our twin timbers. Yep. You know, we do that in a pecan barrel and pecan barrels leak really bad and there's not much you can do about it and yet and to get the pecan flavor out of it and people says well what do you do i said well we just put it in a smaller bottle and charge more <laughs> you know? so, so we're already in a small bottle yep but we got major taste in that small bottle so yeah we're, we're, we're trying to deal with this there's going to be a lot of changes in the whiskey business and like i said between us and you guys there's going to be some changes some yeah. new roads yeah, I think that's where just everybody out there, that's where, you know, hey, it's time to do your part, get involved politically, if you will, and start putting some pressure on, uh, you know, yeah. the people that be in your states to start changing these laws and opening things up for craft distillers. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that I can ship this. In the US <laughs> post office, right? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> the post office will ship hand sanitizer, but they won't ship whiskey. Right. So we're gonna have to start calling, put on the label, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Special labeling through the TTB. We're selling hand sanitizer right. that was yeah. aged for four years in a barrel. <laughs> and, you can lick your, and you can lick your fingers too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna spin us back just for a second here, um, just because, like I said, you have a really kind of neat life history. So. Like I said, you had a unique life before you started a distillery. Would you mind telling folks like a little bit about what you did before you decided to uh, start a distillery with your wife? Because I, I found that pretty neat, just just your your history. Been a long go. Some of it I can't remember. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> I fair. Grew up, I grew up in the woods. We had 720 acres, a lot of it white oak. And one of the things we did in the wintertime was make stay bolts. In those days, you didn't haul white oak logs to the stay mill you made bolts in the cut in the then you loaded bolts split them hold them to a stay factory so i'm kind of familiar with the stay mill business not the same mill business but you know the white oak and growing the white oak and kind of had that in my belt so i spent a lot of time trying to get away from that so i got a bachelor's degree in biology and that was really interested i just dug up an old paper about yeast back in i hate to say it, it was in uh, 62 i think <laughs> so I've always been interested in the microbiology part of it and uh, I was in the Peace Corps in India and that's when I really learned about thinking outside the box and that's what I've done here with the distill with the whiskey business is back up and look at it outside the box and what do we need to do here you know what's really the way to approach this so the Peace Corps taught me to think outside the box and I came back and got a master's degree in agronomy so I spent most of my professional career dealing with corn, wheat, and soybeans. And it always amazed me that we make all the whiskey we make in this country, and most of it in the world that's coming corn-based, is made from corn that nobody eats. Yep. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> nobody eats that. Yeah. Really. So I spent about the last 18 years, 17, 18 years, working for an independent state company. Of course, they're the big dogs in the barrel business, and it all comes from Missouri. So I started this company with two basic concepts in mind. One, let's use the corn that people, that humans, human beings eat all over the world, and that would be blue corn. Yep. They eat that directly, and they have for centuries. So I don't say that's a good tasting corn. Just let the whole population of the world decide what that is. And the other thing is we make all the barrels for the world here in Missouri. Yeah, there's a few exceptions, true, but they're kind of minor, really. So we got all the wood in Missouri here, and we don't make any whiskey. Now, what's wrong with that picture? <laughs> <laughs> and we make all the whiskey we do make out of number two yellow corn, which nobody eats. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm, I have the advantage in not having great-grandpa's recipe that I have to honor. Yeah. I don't have to have the tradition that's been passed down to me for nine generations to say, 
Now, Gary, you got to follow this recipe because I don't have one. I come from a family of teetotalers. You know, we came from Scotland. We came from Germany. We Everybody in those the old country drank, but somehow or other we got to this soil and we said, oh, drinking's bad for you. But anyway, that's my immediate past. So looking at the situation and coming from the independent state company, I thought, why don't we make whiskey? People said, well, you got to do that in Kentucky. Yeah, and with Missouri corn and Missouri barrel, you got to do it in Kentucky. You can't bring it across the line. What's the deal here? So I put up with no, you can't do that for a long time. And meanwhile, back in 83, I went to school to learn how to distill for farm ethanol. So the science part of that part I've had for a significant period of time. And, and, and about that time is when Tito got started. You think about it. Mm -hmm. You know what? He was in there early. and He was just a craft distiller. And look what he's done today. He's become the number one vodka producer in the United States. And that's great because it's all it's all American, South American. Corn made in America. So it's not made in a 50-gallon pot still out in his backyard anymore, which he <laughs> would like for people to believe. But <laughs> needless to say, I missed that whole curve. So for you guys that are not from Missouri, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going to happen in Missouri. Because all you got to go is you got to go to the East Coast, and then you got to go to the West Coast and see what's happening and just add about five years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when, when I first went to my ADI conference, American Distilling Institute in 09, I came home and said, Oh my God, there were 45 guys on that bus today, and they're all going to make whiskey. Why don't we book Missouri? So that's when I started thinking about it. Started a company at 11, and I said, okay, well, we got to start with the right corn. So in 12, I got the Pueblo Indians to sell me a little corn. Nice. And we started growing corn a year before we even had a still because I wanted to start there. Now, most people say, Oh, you discovered heirloom corn. No, we never just we never used that yellow stuff to start with. We started with this. So you know that's and I didn't have great grandpa's recipe, but you know the thing about great grandpa was using that corn. Yeah. yeah. That's what he made his whiskey different from the neighbors. It was the corn. So that's where we started. I mean, if you think about it, you only got four things to make whiskey. You got grain. You got water, you got wood, and you got time. But the first big thing you got to start with is the right grain, because from there, you can't change it. It's changed everything. Mm -hmm. And in the whiskey business, it really amazes me that we have got stuck in the trench that says, there's a difference in corn? Isn't it crazy? It's like the wine business. You mean there's a difference in grapes? Yeah. And, and you, 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 business, you mean there's a difference in hops? Really? <laughs> in the whiskey business, we say there's a difference in corn? You know, it's so simple. And, and I've had the, the opportunity from not having come into it from the backside and looking at it from outside the window, so to speak, and thinking outside the box and say, what kind of corn should we be using? And that's where I started. So in some ways, not having all these historical things in my family on this, you got to do it this way and that way. It, it released me to do what I thought was really the right approach. Well, and that's, that's what I loved when I, when I first saw your guys' distillery and kind of learned about it on the website, which by the way, have a fantastic website that's linked in, in the YouTube description. Check that out. It, it is yeah. full of packed with information. Um, I just love that you were like, like you said, we lost something over 60 years you know we, we lost what made everything unique so you're like first thing was like i'm going to go back to start with what made things unique and kind of just jumping right into it from there i, I just i just love that starting point that, that's awesome um, yeah it's a bad place to start you know there's a reason that we quit using all those corns a damn good reason <laughs> we didn't just all of a sudden accidentally quit using those we found out they didn't raise good corn they didn't make good bushels. Yep. They didn't stand up to harvest. Everything, 
loved them, including the deer and coons and mold and funguses and leaf <laughs> life and, and rootworm. Everything loved those corns. So we got rid of those corns and went to a corn that grew, stood, dried down, yielded high, and made hog fat. You know, and that's where we've gone. And we've selected for the last, since the 30s, we've selected corn based on yield. Mm -hmm. You know, and we not even protein because protein comes from the soybeans anyway and the, and the red meat business. So, and, and the, the whiskey business kind of got caught up in that whole, you know, number two corn era thing. And that's yeah. what we've yeah. gone to. And we've lost taste in the process. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so, if you look at number two yellow corn, and it's all going to be BT corn today. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not to be throwing verbiage out there, but Bacillus thuringiensis and that bacteria, if, if, if something, an uh, insect eats it, it dies. So if an insect eats that corn plant and dies, and we're going to make whiskey out of it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, yeah. it sounds backwards. That's that's. I mean, that, that's. You know, I, uh, <laughs> let's, let's look at this in a different way, guys. Okay. So, oh, well, it's more expensive. Well, sure, it's more expensive, but hey, well, that, what could it really cost? No, and that's where a lot of people uh, watch the show and everything. Where you're like, well, you know, sometimes it's fifteen, twenty bucks more for for something that's made with a more unique corn. But you, I mean, we found uh, between you and Iron Root and a couple other people, that makes a tremendous difference in the flavor. Yeah, like yeah. it doesn't. Yeah, let, let me let me show you some economics. As our bloody butcher read, they got the best whiskey in the United States award among like eighteen hundred distilleries. Okay, got it. Went to Germany. It's it's been everywhere. Mm -hmm. You guys top honors. Okay, such so a good whiskey. You know how many of them are making a bushel? Uh, you were going with the other one, 250 or something like that. I'm guessing probably about that same, same yeah, we're, area. Yeah, we're, this retails for about this damn camera's backwards for some reason. But anyway, <laughs> we fight with that every episode. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time. Every we retail for about 86 bucks. Yep. Get 15 out of the bushel. Who cares what the corn price is? Really? Mm -hmm. So we need to kind of change our thinking about, focus our attention to what really tastes good and what makes a good whiskey and kind of forget about at the present time what the corn costs. So corn's three bucks a bottle. I mean, three bucks a bushel. So what if it's 20 bucks? You really didn't do anything. The copper, the stopper in the cork costs more than that. Mm -hmm. And we're weighing our decisions of something that does has no cost involved, and yet that's responsible for most of the taste, which really surprised me. And that's what that's why we didn't go that direction. Now it looks like you guys were using red and blue corn. This kind of you've already kind of covered this, but are you guys using any other heirloom <laughs> corns or corns at your place? Corn is one of your your big kind of selling points. You do have a couple of bourbons and stuff too, but. Corn seems to be something you guys were focusing on. Yeah, that's that's where we start. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, these are these are our main corns today. Okay. Uh, so we do a white corn because of the red, white, and blue. Okay. We make, yep. We make three different corn whiskeys, and then after their age, we pull them out and blend them because each corn tastes different. It fits on the palate different. Mm -hmm. You know, your blue corns are so smooth on the front you know and and no finish on the back i mean the blue corn the aged blue corn we've got the best whiskey at adi two years so far and it's just so smooth you can it's just so gentle and smooth and when you get ready to swallow you think wow what happened to the whiskey i just drank it's gone <laughs> that makes you go back that, that makes you go back to the drink yeah you're you ready to do another one you know you can just sit around and drink all afternoon and have to go upstairs on all fours and <laughs> just go right to work the next day because it's really gentle on what on us also so you switch that up to a red corn and all of a sudden it's not smooth on the front it's not much in the front it's all in the middle 
I mean, just amazing. Just changing that corn out will change where it sits on our palate. Spiciness. It's a big, a big, robust, in the middle kind of a thing. And when you swallow it, it's really nice. Mm-hmm. Goes down smooth, no burn. I mean, there's a difference between hot, between warm and burn. You know, mm-hmm. you can stick your hand on the fire and warm it, but you go past it and you burn it. You know, that's kind of a negative thing. And that's where a lot of our whiskeys are. It's because when you swallow it, you think, oh, shit, why did I do that? You know? <laughs> so we try to stay away from that burn. And that the red corn, it's got the taste. And then when you swallow it, it's got that nice, warm going down. And it sits right here. And it's just really nice. It's just nice and warm. It's just a real friendly thing to have. Yellow corn won't do that. Yellow corn is fire. If you think about some of our most whiskeys, you put it in your mouth, it's fire around the edges, fire up front. And when you swallow it, there's not middle, much in the middle. Yellow corn is not much in the middle. It's mostly firing around the cir- circumference of the tongue. And then when you go to down, it burns like hell. And it keeps burning. When you sit it down, you think, man, I need to go take an antacid. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hate to be accused of having a whiskey that you had to have an antacid pill to enjoy it, you know? So we try to make a whiskey that is enjoyable and is gentle on the body. And that's not where we typically have gone in the whiskey business. No, I know there was one night where Mike and I were competing about who was going to go get Tums first after <laughs> the first made yeah. like three reviews one night, and I was like, "Whoa!" I'm like, "Yeah, that's I need to go get some Tums." Like, hold on, and I'm like, Mike's like, "I'm going to do the same thing. We'll come back and come back to this." <laughs> yeah. uh, let, just, me show you, uh, let me show you some stuff around the corner. We're going to plant corn. Uh, we're planting heritage corns. Okay. Heritage corns don't like cold weather. You know, they die easy. They don't like, they rot really good in dirt. So you got to have warm weather and and dry soil and and you got to have them looking at the sunlight when they come out of the ground. They don't want to be sitting there for a couple weeks. So we're doing some things. The rest of the world, I mean, the rest of the world is looking at this kind of corn. And this is a flint corn. It's not a dent corn. You know, the the kernels here are smooth, kind of like a popcorn. Yep. this is where the rest of the world's going. We only use dent in the United States and for good reasons. And so we're gonna plant a significant amount of this this year. We've got a license to import genetics from Mexico and I've been to old Mexico and looked around. This is a corn called Chapalete. I mean, it's gotta make whiskey, right? I mean, it's gotta make whiskey. Now we raised this last year and it, it didn't yield for shit, really. It's terrible. But we're going to have to deal with that. We're going to have to get the yield up and keep the taste. And that's a big challenge. And a lot of people have headed that direction have failed. But we're going to get there. That's purple. Cool. Purple corn is, if you want to make purple, what do you do? Mix blue and yellow, right? So, And that's kind of one of the things we do with a red, white, and blue. We really kind of make a purple in terms of that. So we nobody's really done that. They make one of this in, in Mexico. There's a, a company that's starting to make a purple corn, but we're gonna breed her own. Oh, and then we're from we're from Missouri, you know, you need to eat eat, eat local. We have local corn in Missouri. This is the Missouri sheep pig corn. Hmm. And nobody has made whiskey from it. This if there's a native corn in Missouri, this is it. And we've got a, a test plot this year. We're going to grow enough. We won't have enough because it takes us a ton of corn to run a bath in our big steel. So we've got a little small research still. I don't know if Ryan can show you that back there in the back or not, but we've got a small research still. We kind of play with the smaller things. I'd like to be able to make a still that I could take one cob and, and cook it, grind it, cook it, ferment it, and distill it and, and see what it actually tastes like. And then we can learn much faster doing because right now to wait three years three years is kind of important to me maybe not you guys but you know i i count them years pretty pretty carefully 
So uh, of the with the Missouri bourbons, uh, well, especially with the designation, am, am I correct? You guys are more Missouri than any other distillery in the state. Is that right? Well, I, I hate to comment there, really. Uh, there may be some other distillers. Hopefully they will. We're watching this. Is, what the hell did you say the other night? <laughs> so we try to be as Missouri as we can. I think that's the, that's where the essence of the craft distilling movement is. Uh, I think we're going to get to the point where, I haven't said this out loud to people, but we're ready to start growing, grinding, and providing some ground corn to other distilleries so they can pick that mash bill up. There's our little research still. Yep, he's she hopping went, over to show us that little one. Yeah, yeah so that's kind of designed like our big still. To six, it's a sip plate instead of a bubble cap, but it's a six stage deflagmator. You know, we haven't got the agitator on there yet because we do grain on grains. So you got to agitate it. So uh, we ran a batch this morning. I had to screen it to get it that way. But I think when you screen it out, you lose the full bodiness of, of, of distilling on the grain, actually. I may be wrong. So he's but anyway. Sneaking. Oh, he's yeah. just doing work. I thought, I thought he was doing something else. Yeah. Like sneaking us into something in the back. Hold on. So anyways, in, far, in terms of being more Missouri than anybody else, I wouldn't know. I'm not going to go there. Uh, we're going to try to do more of Missouri stuff. But if we maybe if five or six of us do a Missouri corn with all the same Missouri bags, we can get together in two years, put it in the same barrel, and then we can kind of talk about, well, his tastes a little bit this way or his tastes like that. And then we can talk about what we as distillers bring to the table as opposed to the barrel or the mash bill. You see what I'm saying? That I think that would be really interesting for everybody to talk about and it would stir some conversation. Yeah. And especially if you were if down in Missouri, like if you could get together for like a tasting where you could have have each of you guys there and have your have like your samples and people try them and kind of go over what was different and what happened. That would be a, that'd be a hell of a night. You know, I'd, I'd pay a decent amount to go to something like that where you got to have four or five whiskeys and talk to the distillers and, you know, what, what did each person do a little bit different in like a chat? That would be, that would be a hell of an evening. That it's, it's always good to compare how things came out for different people and how you got there. Yeah. We're, and, and why did we're, we're whiskey that? nerds here. So yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, we did, when we did the whiskey trail, you know, we did the, we got together and created, you know, the whole trail situation with the, with the, the distillers. There's five of us went together and put our bourbons together mm -hmm. and made a blended bourbon that when you finish the trail, you get one of those bottles. You can't buy it anywhere. Awesome. And it turned out pretty damn good, really. We got high marks at ADI on it. You know, we won some awards on it. So it's always interesting. I mean, as you guys, as nerds, you know, you, those are the cool things to learn, aren't they? Yeah. You know, about what he, what he did, yes. where he come from. Makes it interesting. And that's yeah. a hell of a thing. That's a hell of a reward to get at the end of going on a trail or going stopping at a few distilleries, which yeah. for a lot of us, you might have done anyway. It's like all of a sudden it's, hey, you, you look what you want. And it's like, I can't even buy that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to go. You got to make around. You got to go to 33 distilleries to get it. <laughs> That's a nice. good challenge. Nice. <laughs> so right. you've talked about the corn. I've noticed you guys do some really interesting things with wood as well, uh, between using like pecan or chinkapin oak. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're doing with the barrels and the wood and kind of the impact that makes. Well, mostly about wood. If you're doing wood, I'm going to probably bring you up on front here. Yeah, it's not really talked much about in the industry and particularly at the consumer level, you know, we talk about two years, three years, four years, whatever, as if wood was a constant and there was one wood and it was, everything was the same up until the point where you put whiskey in it. And, and that's so far from the truth. You know, we've got 10 white oaks in Missouri. They're all gonna taste a little different. Just like if you had 10 different tomatoes, or 10 corns or 10 hops or 10 different kind of grapes. They're, it's all, that's the way the world is. The natural world is not the same. When you change a variety, you change the taste. So the kind of wood you, 
you, you, you choose whether it's regular white oak and, and really the other option in, in, in this part of the country is, is chinka pin oak. Mm-hmm. Uh, they taste different. The acorns taste different. You know, supposedly the Native Americans ate chinka pin acorns instead of regular Quercus alba acorns because they were sweeter. And, and I think that has to do with it. We use a lot of chinka pin oak. There's not much of it. And having a good relationship with your cooper is <coughs> in those things. And unfortunately for most people, in the whiskey business, uh, that, that's not true. But it's really key to making a good whiskey. And and what happens to that wood before you put whiskey in? You know, if they talk about air dry, kiln dry. Well, what does dry have to do with putting whiskey in it? Nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, that has to do with making the barrel. Not what the, if you take a piece of wood and you put it in a kiln and you dry it. Yeah, you got to dry it, but you locked in all the sap when you did that. You just dried out the sap. So when you put water in that barrel, it just dissolved the sap. Come right back out of it, didn't it? Mm-hmm. You take that wood and, and you leave that piece of wood out in the weather. And you let the rain soak that wood. So when you put whiskey in there you're putting two things in the barrel you put water and you're putting alcohol so you only can if it's bourbon you can only put it in there 125 proof which is just a little more than half and most people are just going down all the time in terms of the proof so let's say you're going to put half water and half whiskey well the tannins in the wood and those things that are soluble in water are going to come out if you got high water but if you put it in the rain the rain is going to soak up and leach out those things that the water portion of your whiskey is going to absorb. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if yeah. you leave it out in the rain and let the rainwater soak up all those tannins that tend to be bitter, real astringent, and just don't, that's what we age it a lot of times to get rid of those damn things. Let the rainwater take it out over two or three years. You're going to have a better whiskey. We don't have all of our rain, all of our barrels that are the state we make barrels out of. We let it all sit out in the rain for three years. Yep. We'll make a barrel. Yep, so is- when, we, when we put the whiskey in there, the water portion of the whiskey is not going to dissolve out those bitter, tannic, astringency things. And you're going to make a more smoother, uh, it's going to taste better on your palate. It's going to be so. That, that, those things are important that we don't talk much about it on the, on the oh. consumer side you don't know much about it but if you're going to soar sorry let me bring this up for you again sorry you see what that is there now that's a used barrel that's a stave at a barrel and what's in the middle there is called a red line so the whiskey's up here this is the, this is the toasted side and see how that layer of red that's how that's how deep the whiskey went when it was in the barrel. If you take a piece of fresh oak and you just dry it out, and you put whiskey in it, and the whiskey goes that deep, it's gonna soak up whatever's in that board that deep and bring it out and put it in the whiskey. So that's the reason it's so important that what you do to the wood before you put the whiskey in there is ever much important is what you do after you put the whiskey in there. So you put it in a small barrel, you put it in a big barrel, you air dry your wood, you, you know, how long you had the air dried wood. How do you store it? We store, where's Ryan? Is he still around? Yeah, he's Ryan, out there right now. I can get to him. What do we want to, what do we want him to take a look at? Barrel storage. That's a, that's a big request, by the way. <laughs> you gotta go out back and open up stuff and it's dark outside so we we barrel we barrel age in storage containers okay and the reason we do that is because they accentuate the local temperature if you ever been in one of them things when the sun shines i don't care what the temperature is outside it's hot in there <laughs> so the sun shines on that whiskey barrel and it pushes bridge pressure pushes the whiskey in the wood, brings it back again to a greater extent and more frequent than we could possibly do under normal atmospheric conditions. You know, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, they're all places 
that are good for storing whiskey. But when you put a barrel inside a steel box, you really speed up the process. And then you put it in a two gallon, a 15 gallon barrel versus the 53. There's three and a half times more wood per gallon of whiskey in that barrel than there is a 53. And so you really are speeding up the aging process by three and a half times. So we do both 53s and 15s and our 53s, we're a young company. So we don't have 20 year old whiskey. So we do have six year old whiskey and those barrels are just now coming out. Our Montgomery County batch one, first Montgomery County has some six year old work bourbon in it. It's pretty good. But the two gallon, I mean the 15 gallon barrels that I filled the same day as I filled those 53s, we sold them three years ago, you know, because they were aged already. So all those things go in, it's just not cut and dried, you know, how old is it? Well, it just depends on a lot of different things, really does. We got caught up in that, how old is it thing? For so long, now it becomes a standard question that we ask and we evaluate whiskeys by it. And we forget about other things that are just as critical to the taste as the age. Well, that was something when you, when you guys, I first tasted some of your, some of your other whiskey and it is, some of it wasn't even aged a year, but you guys had totally skipped what sometimes we've found in some people who use the smaller 15 gallon barrels and the bigger problem, it's like we always bring up, maybe this was kiln dried. Maybe this wasn't left out for as long as it was. With you guys picking the ones that were aged for three years outside and really letting that water come out, it has made a, a significant difference as to how the flavor comes through on it. Like, I, I was really impressed. Like, I think you had one that was six months. And compared to some other people we've tasted, it tasted like two, three years old like that. And I'm going to type Ryan. I think we lost him when he was going out to um, – to the barrel storage. I think I think we might have asked him to go too far away from the router on that one. But uh, I'll try to get a hold of him and, and bring him back into the distillery on that. But I mean, that decision I think was awesome. I think it was awesome. Oh, never mind. There you go. Oh, yeah. There he is. Yeah. Hold well, on. you know, it's like in the whiskey business, you can't just change one thing and and not have it affect other things. And just because you change the barrel size. Man, you brought in a bunch of new problems all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So if you make a 15-gallon barrel out of pretty new oak and you don't age it, oh, my God, you got bitterness. You got astringency that's really that's going to come out and kill you in that whiskey right away. And you're going to say, oh, my God, I'm never going to use 15 gallons again. It's terrible. Oh. But it's more important that you let that 15-gallon barrel do its share in the rain more so than the 53, mm -hmm. especially put it in a hot box and you make it go deeper in the wood, then it's more critical. So you change one thing, you got to affect a whole bunch of things. So you're going to have to take those into considerations. Now we got, we got Ryan out, out in the barrel. What, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a, a batch. We're going to distill tomorrow. That's a batch of blue corn bourbon. And this, that's going to be Ruben S. It's pink color. Uh, blue corn, when it changes pH, it's kind of like phenethylene solution. When you change the pH, it turns pink. Uh, it starts out about gray, about 6.1, 6.2. And that as it, as it uh, ferments, pH drops. And see, this is all finished. It uh, sits in there. It's about a specific gravity of one or maybe a little bit less. A little bit of oil on top. When you get into different corns, you've got to watch the, uh, your starch structure is different in corns. You can't just jump in and treat it like number two yellow. Um, the starch structure in red corn is totally different than that in blue. If you take a, make it, try to make a tortilla out of red corn or bloody bitch your corn, you'll never make it because it's not branched, it's not lattice structure, and it falls all apart. So the, when you get into a blue corn versus a red corn, you've got to treat a difference in terms of your alpha and glucoamylase, your temperature of cooking, all those things are different. When you change a corn, you change a lot of other things. You can't just switch the corn and run it through like you did everything else. Kind of like the barrel. You can't just change the size of the barrel because it affects everything else in the process. But this, we're going to distill this tomorrow. There's a, there's a ton of corn and, and wheat in there. 
it's a 25, 75 percent we land, and we'll get about 100 proof gallons out of that tomorrow. So, if you look in terms of fifths, people think, well, how many fifths are in a gallon? It's five. So, we do 100 proof gallons, you get five fifths out of that. We make 500, 500 fifths cool. out of that tank tomorrow. I, I He's running low on batteries, so I've got him going outside to check on where the fire is for the still. Because this okay. was another thing that I totally thought was unique <laughs> about your place. You guys still use actual fire to heat the stills. Yeah. Where everyone else yeah. is not like that. This is another thing I thought was pretty impressive. Just uh, just from being able to do that. Um, it, like another thing like that that was craft where everyone else kind of drops off that section it uh it was something that else kind of puts you on the map in my mind i was like damn you guys are really going that extra mile almost in every aspect i've been a low carbon attitude you're looking in the furnace okay he's he got down on the ground he's looking at the fire in the furnace there so our furnace is outside we we burn scrap wood from making barrels. So we're, the biggest barrel mill, in the, I mean, the state mill in the world is about a mile from us. And I spent 18 years there. So I know I'm, I'm familiar with what comes out of there and what's available. So we burn scrap wood from the process of making barrel stays. So what that fire does, there's our fire compartment. It's more like a, a, a pottery kiln. That fire is running about 1400 degrees and uh, it's ceramic tile around the outside of it. It's showing you the fan there. We do uh, forced air fan. That's our storage. We dump ground wood in that. It's a silage wagon, actually. And that silage wagon dumps in a hopper and an electric guy kicks on, fills a hopper. Have you guys seen these pellet stoves? Mm -hmm. it's kind of the same situation. Yeah. They hook an auger that on a timer. We use three different freak drives to, to run this thing. So when auger pushes it in, we take our heads. People say, what do you do with your heads? We like to fire with them in the next morning. Oh, you know, nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Methanol really gets that wood going really good. At the same time. <laughs> so we're, we're pretty carbon neutral. You know, we didn't dig a hole in the earth. We didn't run natural gas. We didn't use petroleum in anything. You know, this wood was already up here on top of the earth, and it was going to die, and it's going to rot anyway. It's going to turn to CO2 come hell or high water. We're just going to make whiskey in the mid part of that decomposition process. Oh, there we go. He's back. It's a pretty good trade-off as far as I'm concerned. So. I thought we lost him for a second, so I jumped off. But like I said, we got him, we got him outside doing some stuff probably away from everything is. But that, that's just an awesome view. I mean, that's yeah. just it's something you won't see someplace else and really kind of – Pulls you back into the into pat and like history. Seeing something like that is how everyone else had to get it done. Yeah, but we don't really heat the still. See, he's outside the building. So what that fire is doing is eating a tank that's got food grade oil in it, and then I pump that oil into the still to cook with. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually heat the mash with with fire. We keep the fire outside the building, but we don't use steam. You know, your insurance guy, he calls you and says, Gary, what's your water pressure? You know, because when it said work, we comparate, right? So, oh, it's zero. Oh, what's your line pressure? Uh, zero. Uh, well, what's the highest pressure your employees are exposed to in the process of distilling? Uh, zero. You know, so it's, it's a way of getting the fire and the heat transferred to the building um, without having fire in the building. So that's what we do. We come down the road and we have to go to natural gas or whatever. Some, you know, we get different political situations and we got to take two pipe fittings and we have a natural gas burner in there in a couple of days. Back running again. So he's going down. He's running uh, 938 degrees inside the firebox there. I may pull over there and show you what the we're running about 350 to 375 degrees in the pot so uh, you know that surface temp temperature of the mash with needs to be below what starch burns at which is 
you know, look in your cookbook at home. You want to cook something in, you don't need to look in the cookbook. Just put it on 350 and start, right? Because mm -hmm. that starts, <laughs> starts to burn. And so that's what we do is we run about 350, 375 on that oil. And so we don't have any chances that that starts in our mash to burn. That may be, his, his, Ryan's phone may have died. Uh, so he, he may pop up where you are to kind of talk for a minute or two. I was, I was just type him in the private chat for a minute. Um, but that's okay. He, um, uh, he, he did a wonderful <coughs> job and we got to see some of the distillery we don't always get to see of other places. Um, so, so we appreciate Ryan doing that. Um, and if he comes back up, he might, we might widen the screen out to kind of get, get you guys both in there. I'm going to pull that yeah. out for a second. Because back we might have him show you the manifold on our cooling system because everything, you know, the distiller has to heat all this stuff up. He's got about 10% left. left. You want yeah. to say anything in here while you're no, sitting here? He's standing here. <laughs> Tell him to so hop in. People want to see him. <laughs> there you go. So, you know, we've got, we try to be as green as we can. So we've got a, different, a lot of different loops. There's Ryan. Yeah. yeah. He's the man that makes things happen right here. And, and thank you, Ryan, for staying late. Uh, we, yeah. we know we kind of jumped into your day. Uh, we can't appreciate that enough. Thank you so much for doing what uh, you've been doing uh, tonight. Yeah, no problem. I was just finishing up. Finished up and still running about, I don't know, 20 minutes ago. So, so well, make, sure, make sure you before you leave here for sure. Well, I'm ready for bed. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, he's got to get home and get that fire going back again in the morning time. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, like, Martin uh, Jensen was saying, you're, you're doing an amazing job with stuff. So I was going to say that it's always good to hear. I just want to make sure you hear that, too, because uh, we appreciate you kind of staying late and taking a little tour here of what's oh, yeah. going on. Yeah. Sorry about that. So I was going to say, on the, you know, we got the heat upside. Then mm -hmm. how you cool it down? You know, most people our size would – I don't know, maybe need a 75 horse cooler. We don't even own one. We don't own a cooler. So when we want to bring stuff down, we said, no, where can we take BTUs? You know? Well, when we poured the concrete, we just put geothermal underneath the concrete. Okay. Yeah. So nice. dude, the earth is pretty big heat sink, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Throw a valve and we can run that hot water or off the, really off of the, either the deflagmator, the cooling water, we can run it underneath the slab and run it back. Now the earth can take it, but it can't take it fast enough a lot of times. So we, in the winter time, we've got other coils in the concrete floor of the distillery. So as we're running our deflagmator, we can run it down in there in the concrete and it's just a heat sink and heats the building. Oh, nice. So nice. we've also got a big radiator. Yeah may or may not sell it so we can we can divert that oil because sometimes you know wood fires don't have good knobs on them they don't yeah. really respond very good so <laughs> some days you know when you don't want any heat you're at 193 degrees and you don't want to make 94 194 because the oil is going to pop so you'll stop it we can stop in one degree with a wood stove wow but we divert right. the oil instead of okay. changing the temperature we just change the flow we can just heat the building where we're coming back off the back side of that. That's nice. So we've done a lot of stuff to, we got tanks outside, even last night, you know, here we were, I don't know what temperature got in the mid forties, right? You got a 1200 gallon tank outside in the mid forties all night, cost you nothing to cool it down. That's you awesome. got 200 degree water coming off your mash, going into your fermenter. You got to get rid of a hundred BTUs out of 900 gallons. 40 degree tanks sitting out there cost you nothing to cool down. So we got a number of those things. So we chase BTUs around a lot. Kind of depends on the season. We got a radiator about a caterpillar out there, a D8. If we want to run that summertime in August, kick that BTUs out in the caterpillar radiator. Works pretty good. <laughs> that, that's a great way to handle it. I mean, there's not a lot of people that, that would kind of lean in that direction for doing it. So that's sweet. Um, and, uh, we see distilleries, we as a channel kind of see distilleries as a tourist destination for, for people to travel yeah. to. I mean, that's, that's why we like having people come on because uh, the, the way I and Mike and Ben, when we were talking about it, is like if we're going through a state, we're going to do something, we want to know other things that are there that are going to make it make it exciting and kind of make the trip uh, like 
a little bit extra. Um, maybe as time has gone on, maybe we've maybe focused more on distilleries than some of the other things we were going to the state for, but that happens. Um, and I think you guys have done a wonderful job kind of kind of pushing that that envelope to being like, this is actually something really unique to stop at, to see, to get acquainted with, to talk with both of you guys there, to get like that extra in-depth kind of look into the distillery. Um, would you guys agree that that kind of, the tour stop kind of fits your guys' distillery? Like, do you have a lot of people stopping in at the distillery to take tours and um, kind of get that behind the scenes look with you guys? Like you're sharing with us tonight. Yeah, we do probably about a little over half of everything we make goes out our front door. And we nice. get to keep all that money. That's the best thing about it. But you know, the whole distilling business is pretty young. And people that are in the craft distilling are coming from everywhere. You know, we don't have a big source of people who have worked in distilleries for 20 years to know the whole business. Yeah, you might have been worked in a big distillery, but on, for 20 years you ground corn or put labels on bottles or something. We don't yeah. have a big pool of people who know the whole concept. So we got people that are in advertising. We have people in the grain business. We have people in the mechanical engineers. So we all approach this thing in totally different perspectives depending on our background. And that's what makes the craft distilling industry so unique because we it's approached by many different backgrounds and, and they tend to be accentuated. And, and that's what you see when you walk in and say, oh, he's a mechanical engineer. Or oh, my God, he must have spent his life in advertising. You know, it shows up. So I kind of spent my time working with corn and wood. And that's who we are. You know, so with you, with with you and your the tour, which I, I do hope to get over there soon, and and hopefully everything is clear and healthy sooner than later. But uh, it it seems to me that it would be almost more interesting to just see how you're doing things versus the whiskey, which is good. But everything that you've done is just you know, like that is just the most clever thing because there's there's like no waste. There's so much thought into, well, how can we recycle every bit of this mm -hmm. instead of, you know, well, let's get a nice flashy thing. Well, we'll put in a big, uh, big heating, cooling unit. Well, and you seem to approach it as, well, we don't need to do that. We just need to do it smarter. And, you know, I guess, would you say it's, would you say it's more efficient or just a smarter way of doing it or both? Uh, both. I never built a distillery, but this is not my first rodeo either. <laughs> so I, I'm lucky in that respect that I've had some other experiences that we've done and I can bring those into it, you know, and that's yeah. uh, kind of staying with, we need to, we need to, we need to do things on this earth. We need to walk lightly upon the earth. We've kind of, that's a philosophy we feel like, and we're going to make good stuff first of all, but in the process of making good stuff and doing it right, we're going to try to light lightly walk on the earth that's the biggest thing that's a big thing yeah. for us yeah. and i like that too because it just it seems like you guys are taking a lot of things into consideration and guys are making decisions yeah. where some other people may only think be thinking about one thing you guys were thinking about uh, the very holistic approach to to what was going on um i, I got like, in go in ahead, the morning clock when ryan gets here and builds a fire he's going to get that fire going but the next thing he's going to do is pump up the still you know what he's going to do with that? He's going to put that in a cone bottom tank. And then Bill's going to come by at 8 o'clock and pick it up and haul it to his farm and feed cows with it. Mm -hmm. You know? And the cows do one thing very good. And that's to make cow shit. <laughs> <laughs> where are they going to put it? They're going to put that cow shit on the same ground where we're going to grow the corn to make more whiskey with. And it goes around and around. So, uh, we take all those things into consideration also. Our waste products are not waste products. You know, they're food and nutrition for, for making cows or nutrition for the soil too. So that all goes in the, around and around. And, and I think, you know, we're, a lot of us have been marooned, we've been isolated and we've had a chance to think about things about especially as Americans and where we are as a society. And I think we've had a great opportunity to stop and think about where does food come from? Yeah. Where does whiskey come from? Who made it? How they make it? You know, I think it's really good that we've started to ask some of these questions. 
and, and we tried to, I don't want to answer some of those questions when we went about this, we tried to figure out down the road what's going to be really important. And I think we kind of nailed this one. Yeah, I think so too. I got uh, a couple questions in the chat, but I want to ask you guys both a question. First off, Ryan, how long have you been with the company? Uh, just about three years now. Nice, nice. I walked in for a tasting one day and never left. Oh, that, that's a dream. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that, I think you just made every, uh, every 30, 40 some people in the chat jealous as hell with that. <laughs> uh, I mean, he worked here for nothing for a month, and I thought, so funny sorry, one day, I said, you know, i got to start paying you or something. I was thinking about seven months before I was able to quit my real job and do this full time. But still, that, so that's a, about six, seven hours, and then go work eight, 10, 12 hours in my other job, and uh, go home, sleep for a couple hours, come back, do it all over again. That's nice. And with all the stuff you guys are producing, what is, I, I don't know, favorite's a terrible word, uh, so I won't use favorite. What is? What are some of the products that each of you are most proud of producing at the distillery? Or you can do favorite. If you, if you have a favorite one, you can reach over and be like, this is the one. Yeah. <laughs> I think the set just fell off. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we go along, we've we've gained a lot of information. We're learning more about corn. We really love the red corn. You know, that's kind of our that's kind of our thing. So we've got different products we make out of the red corn, and this is our first one. We made a red corn bourbon. We've been waiting a little over two years, actually over three years, but some we, we planted that corn. And then we finally made a, a bourbon out of it. So Right now, we're all really pretty freaking proud of that, really. Nice, nice. We don't have another set of barrels coming ready until fall on this one, so there's, you know, it's limited amount right now in the spring. Well, that's one of the ones I know I was oh, looking yeah, forward to trying to find. Bloody dapper, and this one, you got to be here to get this one. You got to drive by. We only got 200 some, bar 200 some bottles of it, but we got more coming down the road. You know, when you, you plant the corn, it's going to be four years before you can taste it. Yeah. And and it may taste like shit. <laughs> you know, I like, I like the honesty with that. Not everything turns out the way you want it to. So exactly, oh, no, there, there, we already know there's some corns that we ain't going there again. <laughs> you know, so not just because it's organic, just because it's different, it's heirloom, doesn't mean it's going to make a good whiskey. But we're going to find out if you look at what's happening in. Not only in the United States, but in, in, in the, the big picture. And we try to look at somebody else we can follow and mimic and learn from. Um, is there anybody out there? You know, so that means we got to be ahead of the pack, is what I'm saying. Yeah. And we're kind of proud of that. So when we come up and work on something for four years and we come up and, and it's a winner, it's, it's really nice. And we got some things that we're really thinking about there are going to be some big winners also. A lot of people doing the blue, a lot of people doing the red, but. Uh, That's sweet. Uh, Spencer in the no, chat wants to know. What? Out of that day. Oh, that, yeah, that one looks. <laughs> you, you have some things in, in, in the hopper, in the in the cast that are, I, I'm excited to see where they end up at. Um, Spencer was wondering, um, what are you guys drinking when you're not drinking your own, your own whiskey? We'll start off here. I drink beer. I drink a lot of craft beer. Switch it up depending on where I'm at. Uh, yesterday I was having a beer from uh, New Glarus out of oh. Wisconsin. A little spotted cow. Yep. It's just tasty. Fresh, yeah, I just got fresh yesterday. So. And and that's one of those ones someone had to mule to you. We we make fun of that because like with a lot of stuff in the country with whiskey, you you need someone else to help you get stuff places. And I know oh, like yeah. spotted cow. We only sell it here, so you have to have someone pick it up or ship it to you or whoever gets it. I don't know how it got you. We, we don't want to know. Shipping. I got whatever. a friend that travels for work, so he, when he leaves town, he just brings all the local beer you can find. Oh, nice. That's a good friend. Yeah. I, I like fruit. I've always liked fruit. And, and we one of the things we always do is we started from the very beginning. We make cordials. We okay. do black and raspberry cordial. And then down through the time, we've actually started putting this in barrels and aging it for about a year. Oh, man. You know, I like that. People always ask me, well, what do you drink it with? And my pet answer anymore is this. Uh, 
a remote control and a recliner. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so good. I mean, it's just great. But I, I love berries. We do a wild persimmon, which is, uh, that's us, you know. Nobody makes one of these that I know about. We also do a black walnut liqueur, which is our local black walnut, like they're doing a Genochino. We, we would have called it an Ochino, but in Missouri, we wanted to sell it, so we took that name off. <laughs> so, black walnut liqueur. So I like those things also. Nice, nice. Those, those are cool. Uh, Martin says he, he wants you to tell the story about the spoon and the sugar bowl and how it impacted the way you approached distilling. And, and I don't know enough about that, but. Well, I'm going to have to have a lead in. The spoon and the sugar bowl. I I, I don't know. It's... He's going to have to give me a little lead in on that one. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll spin out of the bombs if he pipes. Well, and in the meantime, while that's going on, um, oh, uh, Aaron, he uses uh, bloody butcher corn. He uses um, blue corn. We went over that a little bit early. He's about four or five different corns. So I'm just trying to get over a couple of things. Um, Emily was wondering, are there other grains uh, you want to experiment with, like rye or barley or anything else besides corn? Well, we're in Missouri. And sticking with, we grow it all, whatever we make whiskey from. And in Missouri, we don't grow good rye or barley. And so that's the reason our third grain is, is wheat. So we've got some people experiment with different ryes and barleys, and as that kind of develops, we will bring in some barleys and rice. So we've not, since we use corn that has taste, we don't have to bring in another ground for something that, uh, since the yellow corn doesn't taste very good, you don't have to mix rye and wheat with it, so it tastes good, okay? So we use the great corn to start with, but as the, the growers who are going after the rye and barley develop local strains, we will move into rye and barley. But right now we're sticking with what, we grow everything ourselves. Yep. or worth our friends or, you know, acquaintances. We grow everything ourselves. So that kind of locks us out of rye and barley at the present time. Yeah, that, that's fair. But I mean, like it's, it's exciting. I think when someone's going in as in depth as you are with a certain grain and making such good stuff, they start, their brand starts to twirl as, what would you be doing with other stuff? And I know mine does that too, you know? So I understand the question, but I like how focused you are with producing wonderful stuff with what you're doing. Um, the other thing is that when you go to the marketplace, you know, there are no empty spaces in a liquor store. Yeah, that's true. So when I come out with something new and I want to put it on that shelf, something else is going to come off. And it might be mine. So, I mean, as, as, as whiskey nerds go, would you ever try this? You ever try this? You do it at midnight, you do it naked or whatever, you know, you want to do it these <laughs> other different things. <laughs> if it tastes good, yeah. But ultimately, you got to get cash for it. And the big places we get cash is in the liquor store. Mm. And everything new that goes up on the shelf, there's something else that's got to come off. And you have to keep that in mind that you've got to make something better. And when it comes off, it's probably going to be yours. And that, yeah. and that, that is a scary, <laughs> scary thought. Um, and, and just, just getting back to something else, uh, you guys mentioned the, some of the awards you've gotten, but congratulations on the award at the, at the Berlin international spirits world award. I think you guys took uh, best corn distiller along with some, some other awards there for your corn. Um, how does it feel to get that type of recognition for what you guys are producing? I wasn't impressed with the Berlin. I knew we were going to do that. Because, well, let's face it. And this is brought to my attention from a guy who makes, from my still. Mm -hmm. He makes stills in Europe, okay? They don't have heritage corn. Oh. Corn's ours, right? This is where it comes from. They don't get that. They get corn for starch to feed cows and chickens and so forth. So they don't even have the presence of those, those, those tastes. And when he came to the States and, and we were at the ADI conference, he said, oh, my God, Gary, he says, these tastes don't exist in, in, in Europe. 
They don't exist. You know, your buddy put your red, your Hopi Indian, your, oh, those things don't exist there. So I thought when the Berlin show, I thought we're just going to send them all corn. And, and it worked. Mm -hmm. But it's great, but, but they don't have those corns. But probably the most impressive thing was the Denver International. Okay. Now, if you, you get on the net and look that up, and you look at some of the guys we beat out, you're going to be really impressed because a lot of those guys, you know, you can't get them. You know, mm -hmm. they're rationed out and they're two bottles of, a year for a liquor store and all that kind of stuff for them. You can't get them. We beat all those guys, we took the best to show. So to me, that was a more meaningful thing yep. than the Berlin show. I kind of knew we would score big in Berlin because we had something totally different than anybody else ever sent there. And the ADI, ADI is all other craft distillers. So if you want to kind of compare yourself to people like you, then that's American Craft Spirits Association and American Distilling Association. So that's kind of where I've relied on those people to us compare to. So that those are other craft distillers. We, we I looked think at we've got a lot to learn about judging. Gonna get a burr under my saddle about the <laughs> judging thing. So I, I know some other places that agree with you about uh, how someone who creates something can sit on the panel uh, making decisions about it, or mm. or or someone that knows nothing about it. Because we had someone on that was talking gin one night, and they're like, "How can someone who has never made a gin or tasted a gin uh, be the one judging gin?" You know, <laughs> just just doesn't really seem seem like it should be plausible. Uh, so so yeah, we we we've met some other people that frustrated with that as well. You said a corn whiskey that's a fantastic corn whiskey, and it doesn't taste like corn whiskey because you work so damn hard trying to not make it taste like corn whiskey, <laughs> and they give you a low score because it didn't taste like corn whiskey. Right. <laughs> so we're actually got a group together that are going to tackle that problem. If we're going to grow and mature as craft distillers. We're going to look at other grains and we can't be constantly compared a bit about the way we used to do it or we'll never grow. You know, I mean, I can imagine going to a wine tasting competition and somebody says, well, I don't think it tastes like Concord grapes to me. Well, well, sure it doesn't. <laughs> you know, it's been 40 years trying to get away from that taste. So we've got to change our attitude on how we judge craft spirits in order for us to grow as an industry. And the industry is going to follow what the, the, the craft guys do. Yeah. You know, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we were pondering going to the ADI, I think this year, and then we saw how much it was just to show up. <laughs> and Ben and I were like, I think we'll just go to a couple of distilleries instead. Cause, cause, <laughs> cause, cause, Cause showing up was pretty beefy. I was like, I don't think they're going to give us media passes this year. I was like, that's yeah. not going to fly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, you, obviously we, we enjoy your whiskey and, and we thought you were, you had a fantastic story and how you're, how you've engineered things and your impact on, on, or I should say your lack of impact on the environment is, is great. But I do have to tell you, we had, uh, we had another distiller on, but Colin Keegan from Cole Keegan on and, and he was kind of fanboying over you. <laughs> And uh -oh. that was, that's one of the coolest things. He was just like, I always want to talk to him, but I feel like, I feel like a little, like a little kid trying to, <laughs> trying to approach him. And that, that's one of the coolest, coolest compliments. I think when you got another distiller, who's, who's the, almost afraid to talk to you because they're such a big fan. I think that that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. And, and to get that kind of respect from other people, we kind of, yeah. we kind of dig. So, I mean, well, we got some pretty good names in Kentucky that are starting to do what we do. I thought, where do you hear that? <laughs> well, they brought one of your tours like three years ago, Gary. What do you expect? You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Did that with what was it? Uh, I think Buffalo Trace came out with like, they're like, we have the, yeah, the okay. first kosher release of, of whiskey. I was like, I know three other people have been doing that for like five years. I'm like, that's yeah. not anything exciting. I'm like, whoop yeah. shit. You know, I'm just. Whatever. I'm like, claim whatever you want, but that doesn't that doesn't yeah. get me excited. I'm like, there's like three, four people I know that just that's what they do. It comes out that way and no big deal. Sure. Um, well, but, thank you guys for being fans of the industry and, and, and doing this thing. This is what makes our world turn around. Really. Yeah. It's guys like you that they get into it and they think about it. And you talk about it. And you tell your friends about it. 
and, and you realize what's involved with it, and we get to tell you what we do, and, and uh, you pass it to your friends, that's what makes our whole world turn around, guys, and, and yeah. thank you for it. No, no, we, yeah. we appreciate it. it. It's a level of respect because we know how much – work goes into it and as you become a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper getting into it rather than just tasting it you start looking into how things are made you know how much time work and effort and knowledge goes into trying to get just a specific flavor and all the things that go into it so it's pretty amazing to do that we usually don't keep people on here too too long so i got i got one other question we'll probably let you guys go because we're running an hour 15 hour 20 and we we don't want to keep you all night. You know, we got stuff going on. Um, but what are some of the upcoming releases you guys have coming out this year or or got halted because of the the, the virus coming out? Because um, I know you said you had about three or four earlier today. Um, well, we got the we got the first Montgomery County bourbon. Yep. Batch one. You know, six year old whiskey's in that. That's the first thing. We kind of got just chalk block. In the, in the starting gate with that one. The second one is our Bloody Dapper, which is our red corn bourbon. And the third one is our Tawny Port. Oh, shit. Oh. No, yeah, whatever. <laughs> We're late. I can say whatever. We're this late. I can yeah. say whatever I feel like. Now. Tawny Port is, you know, Tawny means wood, but uh, it's not a Tawny Port. It's a Tawny Cordial. So it's, we call it Tawny Berry. We haven't got the label yet, and I showed it to you tonight, but I don't know if you guys have ever thought about having a program on how to get a, a label through TTV. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a mini-series. I mean, yeah. Oh, my God. It's, it's, they, they really – oh, we could go on on this route. Yeah. yeah. And, and we've uh, talked about some other people, other distillers, the same thing where kind of veered off. We're like, yeah, we could have a mini series on this. But we want all of you guys to still be able to produce stuff because we feel yeah. like someone from the TTB would watch and be like, well, all these people are really bitching. And like, I don't wanna, I don't want to get you all in trouble. <laughs> but but yeah, we, we've had a couple other people that are like, well, if you really just want to get it through, you might as well just and you like your label, just submit it like three, four times, just straight as it is. And, and see if someone likes it any one yeah. of the three times and approves because <laughs> there's so many random people out there. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's a major bureaucracy. Um, and, and if I was one of the big major guys, okay, I'd have somebody or five people and that's all they did was deal with DTB. Yeah. No problem. You know, some of the language was written back in, Prior to prohibition, we don't even use words like that anymore. And so when you're trying to fill out this form and, you know, as, as a government agency and they said, OK, you go out and we got to have this on a computer. So, right. So you're a government agency and you don't have anybody who knows a computer because you haven't got a computer. So you got to hire somebody to do it on a computer and you don't know how to ask him the right questions and you don't know what, but you got to take the cheapest bit. Right. We get into that situation and TTB is not an exception. So you try to do the paper thing, which didn't make sense to start with and out of date and out of verbiage. And you try to convert that to a computer and then hire somebody. Oh, maybe I shouldn't go here. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that's why we won't push you down. That's like we said, like uh, yeah. there's, there's obviously a, there's a whole like, Two week series. If we did something like twice, two or three nights a week, we could go two, three weeks yeah. with the people we've talked to about this. But we we also don't want to get everyone in trouble. <laughs> so the, the, yeah. yeah, right. Now we yeah, we think, we get it. <laughs> I think we could make a highlight show of just clips of every distiller's response to the TTB question when it comes up in an yeah. episode. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. But maybe we don't want to share that with too many people. Right. <laughs> we, we, we won't make a show just of that. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, 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 um, and then if you really want to get interesting, switch from whiskey to hand sanitizer in a week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we did talk about the four-year age sanitizer, you know, yeah. barrel age sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we get going here, Bill Edwards is wondering if your location is open uh, to do sales yet, or is that uh, at the moment, or is there like a future date that you guys are looking to be able to sell stuff out of the distillery you get? 
No, we're open and uh, selling, and we're just not doing tours right now. Okay. Very okay. cool. We're in a taste room with six people at a time. Uh, we prefer people call ahead just so we don't have too many people <laughs> waiting around. Please respect the distillery. That's, yeah. that's pretty standard, you know. Don't just show up in the middle of when he's trying to do some work and be like, hey, can you stop for 10 minutes? Uh, we we actually were doing an interview with uh, one of our uh, friends who's a distiller up in Canada. And what, what what happened, Mike? I know you guys remember that uh, with Mark when he was. Oh, uh, when it, when, well, one, one, somebody had shut the water off in the back room. Yeah. So they wanted to say it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he took off running with that one. Um, oh, are, are you talking about? talking about mark like there the water wasn't going in yeah uh so and and it was and during that time there actually happened to be a tour that showed up so yes. his wife was giving the tour and then as he figured out that the water so he took off running and goes back and tries to fix it and meanwhile this tour is still going on his wife's doing the tour walking everybody around in there yeah like the so so there's no water going into the mix so like the one of the look that's the thermometer had popped up and there there was very heavily uh, alcohol lofting air going through the place. <laughs> and he was like, he like, you could see he stepped outside of the screen for a second, came back and he was like, I needed a second. Like that was more than I was expecting. So, <laughs> so we almost got that, that moment on TV, uh, on the TV that we weren't expecting. Um, We're going to try to limit our exposure. I think they're trying to mix the uh, science with ignorance and <laughs> Reducing exposure as much as possible. At the same yeah. time, we've got to have employees. We can't have, you know, we just can't flaunt it out there. So our thought is to limit the number of people who are. We live on I seventy. You know, the whole world is out there on I seventy, and so when we open the door, it's not only local people, but anybody who they get a car that goes from the east coast to the west coast, and so we're trying to limit that exposure to the number yeah. of people. We're going to try to move outside as soon as we possibly can. I got these three oh, mushrooms I'm going to put up. They're seven foot apart. I mean, seven feet across on the tops and about 10 feet tall. I'm going to put three of them on the ground and maybe they'll put a thing outside and have some fun with it. Well, you know, I think that. Got a 1958 Apache pickup that looks pretty damn good. Going to try to serve out the back of it on the outside. And so we're hoping to get outside and maybe enhance the experience in the process. Yeah. Uh, but try to keep people out of the distillery where more of the people are there, so we reduce that exposure. Oh, that's uh, an excellent yeah. idea. There's just not enough people thinking that way, especially with it's supposed to uh, die out pretty quick in the sunlight and stuff. So I mean, that that's an excellent idea. Is kind of keeping people outside and but creating a fun experience for them. That's yeah, awesome. we're gonna uh, get a lot smarter before this is over. You know. Yeah, that, that's very true. Um, and like I said, we'll let you guys go in a second. But you guys were also saying that. You're coming up in the next week or so, uh, week or two weeks or so. You guys are planning on maybe doing deliveries out to some places in the state, like you're allowed to do. Um, so, and, and you said like if they're looking to do something like that, to give you guys a call, set something up where, like we, like we were trying to suggest, maybe get two, three, four people together, get a few bottles at once, make it worth something to stop out like that. And if you don't happen to live in the state, um, you know, and you want something like that maybe email me or give Mike an email and mules happen. Um, we can, we can, we can maybe set something up like that for all of us, not living, <laughs> not living in that state. So uh, down in the link be below when you check the the comments, not the comments, but uh, it's basically the main screen for the, for the talk tonight, you'll see both of our emails. You can get a hold of us and we'll see if we can't put something together where we can, where we can help you out in that manner. Um, well, and then true, you know, we got people getting pickup truck on Saturday morning drive from Des Moines to New Florence. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I know somebody else near New Boyne, Des Moines that really wants some whiskey, I'll say, well, you know, he's probably pretty new. Let me just put it on hold. Mm -hmm. We've had people from Denver. We've had people from Estes Park. We've had some people from all over Colorado say, you got anybody coming out this way? I said, no, but tomorrow we, boy, we will. <laughs> you know, I, I, somebody come in. Oh, you're from Colorado. Hey, would you mind taking this over there? You know, we've had people. And, and you'd be surprised how often most people are really open to do that. That that's how I ended up getting uh, some samples from someplace. As I, I wasn't able to go out there because uh, of the, the pandemic and stuff, but someone else is making a trip in, and they're like, "Well, I'm going to send it with Greg, and he'll text you, and we'll meet up, and you know, we'll get a trade off." And I was like. 
fine by me, you know, and hell, I'll pay for his gas because he's doing me a favor for not having to drive 200 miles. I, you know, like <laughs> that's fantastic. So, so right, there may right, be. Right. Yeah, we're in a new era. We just got to try to figure out what the desire is, what the problems are, and then we just got to sit down and try to figure out. Yeah. And if somebody wants some whiskey, let us know first. That's the first stage, right? Yep. You may be in Fort Worth, you know, uh, have, have a sister in Fort Worth, you know, other relatives, you know what I'm saying? So you never know. Somebody may be going. Yeah, and there's, so there's a way to get around it. There. Let's start there and see if it can work. And you don't know what the possibilities are. And maybe we'll figure this whole thing out together as we go down the road. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, like I said, coming up in an hour and a half, we don't want to keep you guys any later or anything like that. We, we appreciate you coming on, sharing your knowledge. Uh, Ryan, you taking us around the whole distillery and stuff and showing us some unique yeah. stuff. We don't get that from a lot of people, being able to have that extra person kind of doing something like that. So so we really appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone in the chat, for stopping in. Um, we, we love sharing the knowledge. Well, what, I'm not sharing shit. You guys are sharing your knowledge. I'm just I'm just a mouthpiece for someone else getting to share the excitement of what you guys are doing. So um, so thank you everyone for stopping in. Uh, Gary, Ryan, Ben, Mike, thanks everyone. Uh, remember, it's not the size of the den that matters. Or if you guys want to get a, if you guys want to get a drink, I'll wait. It, nothing wrong. Yeah, with that. I got one. we All just right. happen to have some whiskey. <laughs> 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 That's fair. Um, and on remember, that one, we'll, we'll toast to the Twin Timbers. This one is for international competition. We beat all the... Yeah, that one's one of the small bottles, am I right? Yeah. Yeah, that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I may already have my own uh, own order going in. So like I said, if, <laughs> if some people want to contact me, we might be able to work something else out for you guys. But uh, it's not you just... Guys, making this happen you know yeah hey yeah. i will be more than happy to i mean you got wonderful stuff to share we love to get it out to people so yeah. that's that's the most exciting part um but it's not the size of the den that matters it's the love of whiskey everyone cheers everybody cheers cheers let's get into it one two three Let's get some more. Let's get some more.